So I want to talk about this idea of grievances and how they might feed into rebellion. And sometimes when I do these lectures, I do them not because I'm trying to communicate social science research, although today we'll be trying to communicate social science research, uh, but to kind of set up a foil against which I can kind of work in, in subsequent lectures. And so we have this idea of frustration aggression um, and the, the theory of frustration aggression which argues that there should be a relationship between grievances and rebellion. Um, but by the end of today, hopefully we'll have a sense of maybe why that argument isn't quite as useful as we maybe intuitively think it is. And we'll sort of try to lay the foundation for where we're gonna go next on how we can maybe salvage this idea of grievances um, as a source of, of violence. And so I'll just you know begin with the basic thing, right? When we see violence, we, we sort of assume that people are having kind of an emotional reaction, right? Something has, has made them mad, right? That, that's clearly something is wrong. And certainly if we think about violent outbursts on the individual level, there's, there's that emotional component. And it oftentimes sort of intuitively for people, I think scales up to when we're talking about warfare, that, that there's something that is animating people in such a, a powerful way that they're willing to, to commit violence and potentially suffer violence um, as a result of that, that emotional reaction. Um, and certainly early scholarship that was trying to understand why we see conflict both at the individual level, the interpersonal level kind of thing, as well as sort of the, the larger level of, of states or, or ethnic groups um, fighting, pointed to this idea of grievances, that people are, are rebelling, they're reacting to being mistreated. And I think there, there's intuitive stories that we can tell around that. And, and so those of us in the United States kind of grew up with one of those intuitive stories, that the American colonists rebelled because of the oppressive taxes that were being levied on them by, by England, and because troops are being quartered in the homes, and all of these sort of, you know, these things that were such an affront to American liberty that there was no recourse other than to respond with violence and, I guess, throwing tea in the harbor and uh, trying to boot the British out of Boston. Um, likewise, we could point today, you know, there's been long simmering fighting between Turkey and its Kurdish population. And part of that is that the Kurdish population is oftentimes denied cultural and political voice and cultural freedom to have like Kurdish broadcasters around the, over the radios. And those sorts of things might be, might resonate for us as, as grievances that would, would animate violence. We could point to the, the Tamil uh, civil war in Sri Lanka where Tamils you know, pushed back against um, the pro Sinhalese reforms that were being put in place that were essentially displacing the Tamils from their privileged position within society, right? Again, that, that resonates as sort of a grievance argument um, that could motivate, motivate these kind of rebellions. Um, and so this is where this idea of frustration aggression theory comes from, right? That when a group or a person becomes frustrated due to failure to achieve goals, that one possible outlet for that frustration is violence, is aggression. And so if I was trying to test this argument, um, I would assume that where we see the most grievances, the most oppression, the most um, dissatisfaction or animosity, anger, whatever your term is, however I want to choose to measure that, that's where I would be seeing the most violence. Um, and I sh there should be a pretty strong correlation. You know, again, maybe not perfect, um, because again, we've got some wiggle words in there that one possible outlet is frustration. Maybe people, you know, culturally developed the habit of going for a run to get out some of that frustration. Um, but that, that would, correlation is something that we should expect to see. Weirdly, when we try to find that correlation, it doesn't really appear to be there. Um, that it's very hard to draw a straight line and say where there's, you know, clear grievances, um, however we want to measure that, um, that that's where we see rebellion. Um, we certainly can find cases where that's the case, but whether we're thinking about grievances in terms of economic conditions like poverty, whether we're thinking about them in terms of maybe cultural freedoms, it, it's not a straight line um, relationship by any means. And we get some really weird findings when we look for those sorts of patterns, right? So one of the things that is kind of weird is that those people with just like objectively the most grievances, the poorest of the poor, do not rebel typically, um, which again is kind of odd. Um, weirdly, we see people rebelling when things are actually getting better. 
when their material conditions are actually improving. Um, we'll talk about this in a subsequent lecture, but um, one of the weird things, I say weird, um, one of the interesting things about the civil rights movement in the United States is that um, African-American political mobilization came at a time when the quality of life for African-Americans in terms of economic opportunities was actually going up, um, which raises sort of a question, was it grievances or was motivating this or was it something else? And a, a final piece that, that I think kind of puzzles folks for, who work with, on this idea of frustration and aggression is that you can have grievances that are in place for decades and nobody acts on them. And then all of a sudden somebody does. And so just with pri like primordialism, how do we explain that change if we have a situation where those grievances were more or less constant, at least in, in an objective material sense? And so one argument is that yes, grievances are part of the story and they're an important part of the story, but it's a complex story. And so we have to build in other pieces in order for it to work effectively. And so one of those other pieces um, that gets built in is this question of, of who to target with aggression, right? And that it might not be safe to lash out at the source of your, um, of, of your grievance, uh, that source of your grievance may have power, right? And so the, I think the canonical story is, um, you know, the, the boss yells at the, the employee, the employee comes home and yells at the kid and the kid, you know, goes and kicks the dog. Um, and that would be an example of displaced aggression where each step along that chain, the person is looking for a safe outlet to vent that aggression. Um, and rather than doing direct aggression, returning and, and responding to the person that is, you know, caused them anger, um, they're, they're going to a safe target. So maybe that helps to account for some of, of it. Um, Yeah, um, it, it also helps explain why we end up seeing scapegoats um, being so commonly, um, why that, that pattern plays out so commonly that that might be a function of, I have these grievances or concerns or, or anxieties in other places, and I'm gonna lash out at a group that I feel safe demonizing um, and harassing um, rather than s turning against the, the actual source of my, my suffering. Um, Maybe that helps us to, to get at it, but I think it raises this question that, that's really interesting and important about where it's safe um, to lash out. And once we sort of start thinking about where it's safe to lash out, we actually end up sort of getting the sense that maybe there's this, um, this sort of curvilinear relationship um, between a level of oppression that exists within a state and a level of violence or rebellion or lashing out you're likely to see it. So one argument would be that if you are in a, you know, developed um, democratic society, let's say Norway, the amount of violence that you're likely to see is going to be fairly low because the level of grievances are fairly low. There's a reasonably generous social welfare state. Um, you know, things function more or less okay. Um, on most sort of human development indicators, Norway's doing pretty well. And so we wouldn't expect people lashing out because the grievances would be relatively low. Likewise, in North Korea, um, there might be some fairly high grievances, or I could point to um, to China and the Uyghur population that, that's undergone you know, really incredible, intense oppression over the last couple of decades. There's significant grievances there but the level of state control and the intensity of state control is so great, the oppression is so overwhelming and totalizing that there's essentially no mechanism by which a group could lash out in direct violence against the state. And so we wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, violence being associated with oppression um, or violence associated with grievances at that level. But in that middle range where there's enough um, maybe dissatisfaction with the state, but the state also has sort of not committed to the kind of oppressive tactics that would be necessary to crush any resistance, that's the range where you might actually see uh, 
violence occurring. And so that maybe again goes back to this argument that we have about sort of political development and transitions as a, a source of violence, um, a, a dangerous moment in, in states where they're kind of in this middle zone where they're maybe trying to reduce oppression, but that's sort of uncorking grievances and frustrations that have lying dormant when they were, you know, it wasn't safe to act out on that, but the state hasn't reached a point where it's able to adequately support a population and therefore head off those grievances. And so it's it's one more indicator that, that those moments of transition can be very dangerous for states. Okay, so maybe this is an interesting story. Maybe this salvages some of the frustration aggression um, idea. I'm not 100% convinced it does, uh, but we're gonna return to this idea of grievances in the next conversation.